We have a, a Q&A now with my dear colleague, Kyle Tierman, Mudwater's head of editorial, and a true polymath. Wow. We have a special conversation coming up um, between Co Smith and the former clinical trials leader at MAPS. Uh, for many of you guys might know, MAPS is the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. Um, and she was heading up the phase three trials, which recently um, finished with soldiers who had severe post-traumatic stress disorder. So this is treatment resistant PTSD. Um, many of these soldiers had tried to commit suicide before. So MAPS brought these in. They wanted very severe cases. Um, and the most advanced trial just came out in the uh, journal Nature. And after three MDMA-assisted therapy sessions, two-thirds of these soldiers no longer had PTSD. Um, <clears throat> and I just want to put that into to context for everyone because um, I think that right now we're in the midst of the second psychedelic revolution, and this will likely be one of the greatest positive changes we see in society in our lifetime. Um, as many of you know, we're in the midst of a mental health epidemic, and the efficacy of these drugs, um, when assisted with therapy, when, when taken with the reverence and respect that they deserve, I think really can um, shift the course of humanity in major ways because um, they offer us choice, right? They, they are neuroplastic. They allow us to see different options and potentialities in front of us. And I think that if enough people get access to this kind of therapy, it really can change the trajectory of humanity as a whole. Um, for some of you guys who might know, uh, psychedelics have been illegal for the last um, half century or so. Um, there were sweeping bans on these substances that um, really halted a lot of research and led to this mental health epidemic. Um, and I'm sure most people have here have taken psychedelics. And, you know, we've all talked about our great trips that we've had and the dragons that we've seen and uh, all the fireworks. Um, but I think that there's a new conversation that's emerging right now, which is around psychedelic integration. So what is it that we do with that information? What are the habits that we build? And I hope that one day, not far from now, people will be talking about the fireworks of their morning rituals with the same reverence as they do their psychedelic trips. Um, and that's really where we come in at Mudwater. We, we feel that we have a moral obligation to destigmatize psychedelics, talk about them openly, honestly, great stories, humor, um, and that's where Trends with Benefits comes in. Um, psychedelics is one of our three pillars of the stories that we cover. We um, solicit journalists to go out and stay on this beat and really help shepherd this conversation along um, out into society because the final point here is that it's, this is really one of the few bipartisan issues that we have in the United States right now. And that is so fucking powerful that you have veterans with PTSD, you have you know, a teacher with acute anxiety, um, you have a firefighter with depression, and they can all rally around this very real solution that we have in front of us. Um, so for everyone here, I, I really hope that we all take this kind of conversation seriously and um, bring in that next phase of it, which is what is it that we're doing with these insights? Um, how, do we, how do we integrate these learnings? Um, because I think that uh, we can really change the world with that. So with that, I'm going to welcome up Dorna Purang, who's the former clinical trials leader at MAPS, and Koa Smith, and we're going to have a little chat right now. And finally, we have our uh, Trends with Benefits newspapers um, there, which I hope you... Uh, check out and go to trendswithbenefits.com to subscribe to our weekly newsletter. Normally we sell those newspapers for 25 cents on the Mudwater website, but you special people get it for free. <laughs> <laughs> All right, one more time for Koa and Dorna, everyone. <sighs> All right, here Hi. we are. Hi, 
Thank Welcome. you guys for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, that was a wild story to tell. Um, I feel like growing up, um, just psychedelics were very hush hush. Like, I don't want to tell my parents I did mushrooms last night. <laughs> you know, like, um, and this was just such a profound experience for me. It, it literally healed whatever I was going through, whether that was my head or depression, um, in in one experience. And I felt like the world needed to hear that. So. Um, yeah, I'm excited for the story to get out there and thank you Mudwater crew for, thank you Shane and Chris and everyone, yeah. um, for, you know, providing this platform to, to listen. So how's it feel now that it's out? Um, it felt good. It was weird watching it with all you guys it was like, <laughs> and then mixed with like Chris's breathing and we were all, I was all loopy already about to fall over. So. <laughs> yeah. Do you, so telling this kind of story, right? You, you're working with different brands. Um, some of which might not be as cavalier about psychedelics as mud water. Mm -hmm. How does it feel now having this story out there and, and managing relationships with other brands that might still be, in this mindset of stigmatizing psychedelics because you know that's really been where culture that's been the cultural beat for the last half century i mean i i haven't seen what happens yet so we'll see <laughs> i haven't told anyone that this we is got your back out, bro so. <laughs> at least we got mud water so um but yeah it'll be interesting but like i said i felt like um this story was worth putting my neck out there i think um Hopefully, a lot of people see this and can relate to it and um, tell, share their story, feel more comfortable about it. So, yeah. yeah, I know that you you mentioned to me that when you were talking about your head injury and the the feelings that you were having, you were really surprised by how many other people were saying to me too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, when I was going through like the just the concussion healing process, I was go I was I was feeling all these new feelings that I, I was normally was in control of like anxiety and depression and just fear and just like my brain just going crazy out of control couldn't control it um and when i try to tell people about it most 99 percent people were like bro me too and i was like whoa like a lot of people are going through these these emotions a lot of humans are and imagine not being able to talk about it you know and feeling like no i gotta tough this out and I, i'm i'm just I'm, this is me i'm just crazy <laughs> you know um and yeah it's cool that we're all more open about it and i think we can heal some heal some people let some people live a little bit so dorna i'm gonna ask you to put your scientist hat on right now what happened um, <laughs> <laughs> so what happens to the brain when someone ingests psilocybin mushrooms when someone ingests psilocybin mushrooms okay so it's a pretty complex chemical mechanism of action so i'm just going to take it into a little bit more abstract and broad sense um so there are a few different areas of the brain that control um a state that we call the default mode network and the default mode network is this system by which we form our identity, um, and a lot of people associate this with the idea of an ego. And so there's nothing wrong with that. I don't wanna vilify that. I feel like in the spiritual community, we look down on the ego, right? But you know, your ego is your amigo. <laughs> and um, so what happens when you have these identity forming experiences is you know, the reason you form this identity and ego is to protect yourself, right? And so if you have, if your ego was completely dissolved, you would not be able to stop yourself in front of a moving car, right? So um, it exists to protect you, but you know, once we have all of our survival needs met, we tend to get a little bit hypervigilant. And so we will start to um, have a hyperactive default mode network. And so it's shown that the areas of the brain that are associated with the default mode network are more active when we experience trauma, um, both physical and emotional. Um, and so psilocybin, down regulates and decreases the activities in these areas known as the default mode network. And this creates the opportunity for new neural connections to be made. And so I know there are people here in the psychedelic space who have all heard the snow covered hill analogy, right? But I'll give it to you one more time. Um, so if you think of your mind as a snow covered hill, when you stand at the top of it with your sled and you go down and you do that say 200, 500 times over and over again, eventually you're gonna make a path 
that you're going to just go down every single time, no matter how many times, maybe two, three, right? But more or less, you're set there. And so it becomes a very hardened groove. So think of that as like your neural pathways and your neural connections. So if you have a repeated thought, a repeated way of thinking and a repeated pattern, you're going to pretty much always go down that neural groove, right? And so you can think of the psilocybin or psychedelic as like the snow that's covering that hill for the first time and creating the opportunity for you to make new connections and new neural pathways. So you're shifting your perspective in these moments, right? And so when you have these new um, perspective shifts, you can then take it with you and integrate your experience after, right? So what I, what I really loved about the documentary was that it emphasized that it was like this shift that triggered a major lifestyle change that was what ultimately gave the outcome that was desired, right? So, um, so if you're thinking about it in terms of the analogy, you know, if you're on psilocybin for a few hours, you know, think about like, okay, you're, you're setting the sled down a hill and you're maybe creating a path, but you're up against that neural groove and that neural pathway that's been, you know, uh, sled down like 50,000 times already in your life. So um, this offers you the opportunity to make new neural connections in this hyper-connected state that you can then take with yourself to reinforce and then bring into long-term habits so that way they overpower the other neural connections. That's how you create neuro new neural pathways and ultimately new habits, right. ways of living. So let's talk about that integration because, you know, I go to lightning in a bottle on Saturday and Sunday. I'm back at work Monday. I'm like, that was crazy. But now I forget because all these Slack messages are coming in. And damn it, there was an important thing I learned, but I can't quite remember it. Yeah. <laughs> Just do it again. It'll come back. I, I hate I hate Slack. <laughs> I know. So, so let's talk about what's happening in the brain um, in the days after and, and the kind of protocol that you recommend for... Um, patients who you're working with at MAPS in the days following a psilocybin session? Mm -hmm. So just to clarify, at MAPS, we work with MDMA-assisted therapy. Right. Um, so we didn't work with psilocybin, but you know the integration protocols are pretty similar. Um, so within the MAPS protocol, you will um, have the participants sleep over overnight. And these are PTSD trials that we're working on, just to clarify. Um, a lot of times it is um, prompted by physical trauma as well, though. So. Um, so the participant will spend the night at the um, institution, and then the following morning, they'll have a 90-minute integration session. Um, and they're really just advised to take it very slow. We tell everyone that it's a two-day experience, so they're really supposed to take things very slow and make sure that they're taking care of themselves. They may be a little tired or fatigued. Um, and so over the course, it's, it's really not just so much about what's happening the next day. It's over the course of the few several weeks after. So... Um, a lot of people are interested in this idea of, you know, doing psychedelics to treat PTSD. But once, you know, MAPS hopefully receives FDA approval in 2023, it's not going to be MDMA for PTSD that's going to be approved. It's MDMA-assisted therapy. So the way that they integrate the integration is through um, pretty substantial therapeutic um, sessions that occur once every week for three weeks after each MDMA session. And so in total, that is three MDMA sessions, nine integration sessions. Um, you have three preparation sessions before, so you're looking about 12 weeks total in order to get that two-thirds of PTSD or not showing any symptoms of PTSD moving forward. Got it. Yeah. And how do you, how do you recommend that people talk about this to people, to maybe friends who aren't, in this movement as deeply because from my perspective um we are up against this framework in society which is largely oh you're sick here take this pill it'll make you feel better p.s there's all these side effects with it and my understanding is what we don't want to happen is for people to think okay cool i'm going to take this psychedelic and it's going to be this magic pill that's going to fix me yeah. how do you uh, do you have any scripts for people here or, or ways that we can talk about this fundamentally different way to think about healing in the human mind? Yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you for that. Um, you know, I think people, like you said, are very disillusioned with the current modern medicinal frameworks, which is why they're looking outside of it, right? But 
the Western medicinal paradigm is so ingrained in all of us that we don't even realize that sometimes we will take something like a psychedelic or alternative and then put it through the same modern medicinal framework and have those expectations of like, I took this, why am I not better? Oh, I'm going to go take it again. And oh, what's wrong with me? And so, you know, you're having to sort of break out of that and create a new paradigm, right? And that taps into a lot of ancestral wisdom of the, you know, indigenous communities that have stewarded this message, uh, this medicine for a very long time. And, um, you know, MAPS has adapted this idea from them that, um, you know, it's this idea of tapping into your own inner healing intelligence. That's the term that they use. And so um, the way that the therapists are trained to guide the sessions is really not that it's, you know, you're going in and the therapist is telling you what to do the same way you would go into an office for a doctor and they would tell you what to do. They're really making sure that you're your own guide in the process. Um, and that's really important because I feel like that sh is what shifts the paradigm out of like pathologizing into self-empowerment. And so that's what's really valuable for me in it. And, you know, the analogy that we give when they're training therapists is to say like, um, you know, when your body gets like a laceration or a cut, you know, you put a Band-Aid on it. And if you break your leg, you get a cast. Like think of that cast or the Band-Aid as the psychedelic. It is like the tool to help kickstart your healing and create a framework for you to do the healing. But your body has the tools to create the healing and that's where the healing really happens. And so when someone is just reaching for a psychedelic as if it's like a pill and expecting it to get rid of their symptoms, it's kind of like missing the whole point of the paradigm, which is that you're empowering yourself to touch into your inner highest self and your inner wisdom in order to facilitate your own healing. Like how magical is it that you took this substance integrated in nature and then just had a roadmap to your own healing and you were able to just tap all of that from within, like from inside. I mean, that's like remarkable. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to talk about that that roadmap and the habits that you're building right now with a um, a very Tim Ferriss question. What is your morning routine, sir? Um, well, morning routines are funny because sometimes you're like so on them, and other times you're just like, I'm sleeping in. I'm taking a warm shower. And I'm going to drink coffee. <laughs> and then sooner or later, that just like brings you down this path of not feeling like yourself and super clear again. So I have a nice little toolbox when I'm feeling my best. Um, I wake up, I take a nice cold shower. Um, um, I take a cold shower with gratitude. So like instead of being like, oh, this sucks. Like, ah, I'm like, I'm grateful for my life. I'm grateful for this body. I'm grateful to live in Hawaii, my family, and just like keep rattling stuff off. Um, I found that if you do that, then the next time you actually feel cold, you all of a sudden like, you're like I'm grateful for surfing. <laughs> you're like, whoa, that was weird. What just happened? I mean, there? you're also in Hawaii, so how cold <laughs> is the shower? Yeah, well, you know, we have ice baths too, but <laughs> it's somehow still hard. Okay. <laughs> um, after that, um, meditation's been huge for me. Just making sure that um, I give myself that time to just organize my brain and just like know that my brain does not totally control me, you know? Um, and then if I'm really feeling it, some stretching, some mud water, some journaling, and then pretty much set up for a really good day. Yeah. Yeah. And how does that differ from when you're prepping for a big wave session? I mean, it's, it's mm -hmm. sim there's a, an analogy here, right? Which is that you don't know what the day is going to mm. bring you, right? This is like Marcus Aurelius's whole thing of like the, the, emperor would journal every morning about all of the horrible things he was likely to encounter so that he would be prepared and wouldn't mm -hmm. be surprised when they did eventually arrive. That's cool. So, so for you, like when you are, I think it's similar in terms of controlling the things that you can and getting your mind in order. What does that look like if there's a, a big swell the that you're going to go chase? First thing that comes to mind is just like energy management. Like if I don't have nothing to do that day, then I'm just like psyching, like thinking of ideas and work and just like over here calling people, ah, what am I doing? And then if there's like a big wave session coming up, I'm like, like Zen monk. I'm just like thinking about that wave coming in and like constantly like working on my breath holds and like, I'll actually, I'll take a walk outside and like start sizing up some palm trees. <laughs> like, all right, that's a big wave. A telephone pole. I'm like, all right, I could, I'm gonna go. You know, like, just weird little things like that. But <laughs> that we all do, you know. <laughs> yeah, of course. 
No, but mostly just like working on my breath and I'll, I'll stretch, make sure my body is feeling good. No excuses. Body, mind is good. Yeah. So ready to die. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, the, the breathwork component is really interesting here. Um, some people might not know um, Stan Groff, who has that really well-known quote, um, what the microscope was for biology and the telescope was for astronomy, psychedelics will be for understanding the human mind. Mm -hmm. So after psilocybin and the rest of these psychedelics were, were made illegal, he and a few of these other psychedelic luminaries um, went to Esalen and developed breathwork so that they could induce psychedelic states without having to ingest any chemicals. Um, so I, I wanted to ask you what what role breath work has played in your life since that psilocybin trip. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, breath work was one of those things that no matter how I was feeling, it could clear my state, cause sort of like an ice bath, or I'm sure you guys all felt it when we did the breathing earlier. Like, um, it just like breaks you out of that thought process um that you're in and kind of just resets you refreshes you so i was using it as a tool of, of resetting um and also it's like a forced meditation as well like you can sit there for 20 minutes and think about a billion different things and you come to and you're like what did i just do you know but when you dive into like a deep breathing meditation it takes you there you know as long as you're focusing on your breath so um yeah, I used it as like a reset tool. Mm. Dorna, what are your thoughts on breath work? Yeah, I mean, like you mentioned, I think from it's a, a science perspective, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't done the research as heavily as I have with psychedelics. But like you said, this was developed by Stan and Groff as an alternative to using psychedelics, and um, you know, the power of breath is now starting to receive similar levels of funding as other frameworks of science. And so it's always just really interesting to me, you know, um, I'm not that deep in the research on breath work, but what I think of when I see how closely it's being looked at in the same way as psychedelics is how much these like Eastern methods and non-Western methods of healing are being looked at and, and regarded and um, being researched as heavily as like, you know, the oncology drugs and HIV drugs that I used to research before I got into psychedelics. Right. The, there is this kind of blend between ancient wisdom and modern science that mm -hmm. is being connected right now. Um, are you, and I think that you have a unique vantage point of this merging. Um, I suppose the question is, isn't that cool? <laughs> <laughs> it is really cool. It's very complex. It's very nuanced. I think about it a lot. <laughs> Um, it's really tough to to try to create a framework that meets everyone where they're at. You know, I think, um, you know, this whole psychedelic movement is still like bleeding from the stigmata of a drug war. But on I think on just like a, an evolutionary level, we all have this desire to explore our consciousness and we all have a right to. Um, but because of what happened with the war on drugs and the stigma that was created in the society, you know, it just kind of got wiped out. And I think it's really something that if you look deep enough into any culture, it exists. And so right now we're having to like rebridge it into Western culture. A lot of that is being adapted by indigenous methods. And, you know, you want to do it in a way that's indigenous or that's um, reverent to those indigenous communities. But like I said, um, not imposing on those communities and so not displacing them. And, you know, there's a lot of issues out there with like the colonization of ayahuasca and people going out and trying to like have these experience within those communities, which can be disruptive. So we do have this need for like a modern Western framework. Um, and so formulating that is something that's just actively happening every day. Like we're constantly learning from our mistakes. Like how can we be reciprocal to these communities? How can we acknowledge spirit and the mind body connection in a way that won't make the FDA roll their eyes basically. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so massive that we have people like you in this space who can, who have this knowledge and respect and reverence, but can also put on the science hat and get this out in a, in a massive way. Can you give people, um, some insight into what's ahead for MDMA assisted therapy? You said that it's likely to be approved, um, by 2023, last night we were at a, a moderation that you're on with Rick Doblin, who's the founder of MAPS, and it's a very exciting future for humanity if this all goes through. Yeah, yeah, and so, 
Yeah, we have a projected FDA approval by 2023, which is really exciting. Um, in crossing over with what we're doing here, MAPS actually recently announced a collaboration with WeSANA to explore TBI indications with MDMA therapy. Um, so we saw so, so TBI is traumatic brain injury, yeah, okay. which is what Koa suffered from. Um, so yeah, the Wisana is a company that's developing psilocybin and cannabis compounds to treat to treat traumatic brain injuries, which is some really interesting stuff. But data does show that the um, the modality or mechanism by which psilocybin shows potential to treat TBI and other psychedelics is also replicated with MDMA. Um, so they're looking to command. Um, to collaborate on that commercial aspect, which is gonna be really interesting. Um, so yeah, it's gonna be a lot more new indications. There's a huge uh, pipeline of new indications through what we call investigator-initiated trials. Uh, MAPS has a really robust program with that, where essentially if any passionate researcher or investigator says that there's something new they wanna look into, um, they reach out to MAPS, and then MAPS will collaborate with them to work with the FDA and supply the MDMA so that that way it can be um, researched. So there's eating disorder programs, there's alcohol use disorders, there's social anxiety. I mean, there are a lot of different indications from which this can, um, to which this can reach. Um, another thing that really excites me is uh, MAPS' health equity program that was launched recently. Um, they're doing a enormous fundraising effort right now so if you want to help please do <laughs> and part of that um, fundraise will push things through to approval but will also largely fund their health equity plan um, they they anticipate that one of the biggest bottlenecks for really getting this out to people will be the training of therapists and they offer such an enormous amount of scholarships for therapists who are people of color um, to really ensure that there's diversity equity and inclusion and in how this gets rolled out um, and I think that's really important in making sure that the psychedelic space is diverse and inclusive. Um, historically, it has not been. Um, and so I think that's just a really important value up to uphold. So there's plenty of new and exciting things that are happening. Yeah, it's it's so great that you're a voice within this conversation. I don't, I don't know that I mentioned this, but Dorna's an advisor for Mudwater. So we're developing this advisory board. Ragu is a psychiatrist right there. He's another one. Um, you know, we're, we're really curious and we're part of this conversation, but we don't pretend to be experts in any way. So it's been so fun to have these real experts involved in this conversation as we move forward. Last question for Koa, my man. Um, this is a non-alcoholic event. Mm. What does the future of partying look like? Wow. <laughs> That's a loaded question. <laughs> um, well, I'm feeling good off the mud waters. I don't know about you guys, but I'm feeling energized and ready to talk really quickly, and I think I can stay up pretty late on this. So maybe the future is right here, right now, behind that bar. I think it's it's exporting Chris Keener all over the world <laughs> to get parties high on their own supply. Yeah, maybe it's a mix of, like, we're going to start this party off with a breathing session, and then we're going to induce you with mud water, and then uh, we'll do a hugging therapy <laughs> and then you just go and have a fun night okay yes <laughs> guys ko smith and dorna purang everyone <laughs> any last words we covered it all i'm feeling great yeah thank you all everyone right. yeah please say hi to them and thank you everyone so much for coming out and supporting this new revolution <laughs>